Caring for Kids God's Way, a biblical counseling certificate program in child advocacy developed by the American Association of Christian Counselors through Light University. Your ministry is to be a Galatians 6-2 helper. Ours is to equip you with the highest level of advanced training from the world's leading Christian counselors. 24 experts teaming up to create the most comprehensive child studies curriculum for the personal classroom. May the Lord bless your study as you begin Caring for Kids God's Way. A licensed psychologist, AACC Executive Board Chairperson, and author of Counseling Survivors of Sexual Abuse, Caring for Kids God's Way, presents Dr. Diane Langberg, The Epidemic of Child Abuse. Human beings, as you know, commit atrocious acts against other human beings. One of the most horrible of these atrocities is the abuse of a child. A child is by definition developing or in process and the abuse of a child shatters every aspect of their being, their world, their self, their faith, and their future. Such violation forces the child to adapt in ways that are often maladaptive in the larger world. Such viola violation causes the child to develop a view of himself and his world that is based on repeated lies and destruction. Obviously, an understanding of this is crucial or the body of Christ will not know how to respond when abuse is brought to their attention with the possibility then of further damaging the child who was victimized. All 50 states have passed laws regarding child abuse and neglect. A child is anyone under the age of 18 years of age. Child abuse is divided into four categories, non-accidental physical injury, neglect, emotional abuse, and sexual abuse or exploitation. Non-accidental injuries are bodily injuries that cause severe pain, risk death, permanent disfigurement, or the impairment or loss of a part of the body. Obviously, things like battering, burning, scalding, asphyxiation, kicking, or throwing a child would fall into this category. In this country, there are approximately 1,500 child fatalities per year. Neglect is the failure to provide necessary supervision, shelter, clothes, or medical care. This term usually refers to prolonged and repeated failure to protect a child and the child is endangered in its functioning and its life. It means that the absence of certain things in a child's life is considered abusive. It does not include environmental factors which are beyond a parent's control, such as inadequate housing, furnishings, or clothing due to poverty. Emotional abuse is very difficult to prove. The threshold required for proof is usually very high, and it is typically, typically substantiated only in the most egregious of cases. It usually involves mental injury that seriously interferes with a child's ability to accomplish age-appropriate developmental tasks. Sexual abuse involves the persuasion or coercion of a child to engage in or to assist any other person to engage in sexually explicit conduct. I want to consider this type of abuse a little bit more in depth momentarily. Even the most conservative estimates of the prevalence of child abuse and neglect show that it is a significant public health problem. Abuse and neglect have been shown to have significant physical, psychological, and spiritual consequences in the life of the child, and frequently in the adult that they become. And abuse and neglect influence children's attachment to their parents and their relationships to their peers, as well as their relationship to God himself. Jesus has clearly said that we are to let the little children come to him without hindrance. As his body and representative here on earth, it is vital that the church take a clear and bold stand against the abuse of children, both in our communities and in our churches. To do any less is to misrepresent our master and our Lord. Otherwise, we as the body of Christ join with the abusers in hindering these precious and vulnerable little ones in finding their way to him.
I want to go on from here and look a little bit more specifically at sexual abuse and exploitation. Generally, if you consider the substantiated cases of child abuse, the largest category is usually sexual abuse of some kind. The second is non-accidental physical injury. I want to focus on sexual abuse because of its frequency, because of the often poor record in the Christian community for responding to the problem, and finally because an understanding of this type of abuse and its effects will give us a better equipped mind to deal with the full range of child abuses that we might encounter. Like many things, sexual abuse runs along a continuum. It is generally described as any sexual activity, verbal, visual, or physical, engaged in without consent. The child is considered unable to consent due to developmental immaturity and an inability to understand sexual behavior. Verbal sexual abuse would be things like sexual threats, sexual comments about a child's body, lewd remarks, harassment, or suggestive comments. Visual sexual abuse would be viewing pornographic material, exhibitionism, or voyeurism. Physical sexual abuse includes things like intercourse, oral sex, sodomy, digital penetration, masturbation in front of the child or of the adult by the child, and the fondling of breasts and genitals. It is very important to note that these behaviors usually occur in the context of a relationship with an adult from whom the child has every reason to expect warmth and protection and care. Most abuse is perpetrated by a family member or someone known to the child, though in the case of older boys, we are finding that the perpetrator is more often a stranger. Child abuse has been reported up to about 80,000 times a year in the United States, though of course the number of unreported instances is not known. We generally say that in this country, between 20 and 40% of females are sexually abused in some way prior to the age of 18. Most studies find one third to one, or one quarter of women have been abused. Males, one in five, have been abused in this country before the age of 18. A newspaper in the Philadelphia area, area had an article regarding the abuse of boys in November of 1998. Sex abuse against boys was referred to by the author as America's hidden epidemic. Boys who are sexually abused are far more likely to become drug addicts, suffer from mental illnesses, and become sexual predators in turn. Sexual abuse can be a one-time occurrence in a child's life, or it can span many years. The average age at which it begins is six for girls and 10 for boys. For a smaller sample, it begins before the age of six. Abuse that occurs at a very young age, is forceful and repeated, is the type of abuse that seems to be stored in the mind in a way that is more easily forgotten by the victim. The majority of abusers are male. Between three and 10% are female. Most abusers are considerably older than their victims, though again there is an increase in younger perpetrators. Law enforcement officials said in 1995 that 33% of all those arrested for sex crimes nationwide were younger than 18 years of age. Abuse is not all severe, and not all of it has long-term impact. There are several factors that increase the severity of its effects. Abuse that is frequent and of longer duration has more impact. The more closely related a perpetrator and a victim and the wider the age difference, the greater the impact. Abuse by a male has been found to be more harmful than that by a female. Abuse that includes penetration of any kind is more harmful. And of course, abuse that is sadistic or violent is more harmful. Oftentimes, victims who respond passively have long-term impact because they have a tendency to blame themselves. Those, particularly in the adolescent years, whose body had a sexual response to the abuse carry tremendous amounts of guilt. Abuse that the victim has tried to disclose that has received no help in response causes more damage. 
What kind of people would we call sex offenders? It's very important that the body of Christ understand some things about the profile and actions of those we would call sex offenders. There was research done in the 1980s by a Dr. Jean Abel who asked voluntary sex offender clients how many total offenses they had committed. Confidentiality was guaranteed. The results of that study stunned the professional community. 232 child molesters reported 55,000 attempted incidents, claimed success in 38,000 cases with a total of 17,000 victims. Those male offenders who molested out-of-home female victims averaged 20 victims each. And those male offenders who molested out-of-home males averaged 15 victims each. In his research, Dr. Abel computed the chances of being caught. It was 3%. Sadly, these, fixtures, these figures go with the statistics that we have of victims in this country. Diana Russell's study found that 28% of females under the age of 14 were molested, and the number increased to 38% if the ages 14 to 17 were thrown in. Only 5% of these incidents had ever been reported. Dr. Anna Salter, who is the author of a book called Predators, says that in part such things exist because of the problem of deception. Decades of research show that people cannot reliably tell who is lying and who is not, yet most of us believe that we can. It is a very threatening idea to think that we cannot really tell whether or not someone is trustworthy. We should not as Christians, however, be surprised, as the scriptures tell us that the heart is deceitful above all things. Who can understand it? We often seem to prefer living with the delusion that we can understand the human heart and that we can even tell who is deceiving us and who is not. We are fooling ourselves and we are risking our children when we do so. One of the techniques used by sex offenders is that of setting up a double life. It is critical that the Christian community understand this dynamic. Listen to the words of an abuser. I lived a double life. I would do kind and generous things for people. I would give families money that did not have any money that was not from the church treasury. It was from my own bank accounts. I would support them in all the ways that I could, talk to them, encourage them. I went to nursing homes. I would talk to the elderly and pray with them, and I would do community service projects. I used to pick up litter off the side of the road. I would mow lawns for the elderly and for handicapped people. I would grow grocery shopping for them. The man who said these things was in his 20s and the youngest deacon in his church. The double life is a powerful strategy. Socially responsible behavior in public causes people to drop their guards and allow access to their children. The ability to charm, to be nice, to be likable is critical to gaining access. Author of the book, The Gift of Fear, Gavin De Becker said the following, Niceness is a decision, a strategy of social interaction. It is not a character trait. We tend to think that we know the signs of lying, lack of eye contact, fidgeting, picking at clothes, and shifting around. All of those behaviors can be suppressed with practice. Stop for a minute and reflect on the words sex offender or child molester. What kind of words do you associate with those terms? Pervert, creep, monster? It is a misconception to think that child molesters are somehow different from the rest of us. They can be good friends, loyal employees, and responsible citizens. The difference between a child molester and other people is this, they have sex with children. There are often no telltale signs in their public behavior and there have been several articles that I'm sure many of you have seen about the BTK murderer, Dennis Rader from Kansas, and how so many people were shocked. This man is a family man, a church member, and works with the Cub Scouts, people would say. But again, nice is not a character trait, nor are nice activities any proof of integrity, safety, or morality. Offenders live among us easily and are not easy to spot. The protections and policies of our churches need to reflect this fact.
These things are mentioned today so that you will understand the extent of the problem and its complexity. You will also then understand the great need for churches and schools, libraries, and other institutions that deal with children to think through these issues and proactively decide how they are going to protect the children under their care. Listen again to some quotes from child molesters about how they choose their victims and think about the children in your area. I would probably pick one who appeared more needy. The child hanging back from others or feeling picked on by its brothers and sisters. I would find a child who doesn't have a happy home life because it would be easier for me to gain their friendship. I would look for a kid who is easy to manipulate. They will go along with anything you say. I would choose children who have been unloved and try to be nice to them until they trust me very much and they give me the impression that they will then participate willingly. Use love as bait. The church needs to reach out to the needy and vulnerable and neglected children in our midst. We tend as a rule to gravitate toward those children who are successful, the leaders in the youth group, the good students. Our failure to care for the weak and vulnerable leaves them even more susceptible to the predators in our midst. In well over 50% of child abuse cases, the child knows and trusts the person who commits the abuse. Abusers are mothers, fathers, step-parents, grandparents, and extended family members. They are neighbors, babysitters, coaches, religious leaders, and teachers. In one survey of victims, of the 955 abusers identified by them, only 11 were strangers. The baseline profile of those who abuse is a male whose average age is 35, and who has some relationship to the victim or the victim's family. Again, the most common category of people who abuse children is those who abuse in familial and intimate circumstances. Female offenders, again, abuse in between 5 and 10 percent of incidents. Adolescents ages 13 to 17 commit one-fifth to one-third of the rapes and child molestations in this country. These facts must be considered as we set up church and school policies. I would like to go on from here and give you some warning signs to watch out for as adults who are observing and with children. Concern should be raised whenever an adult refuses to let a child set his or her own limits. When an adult insists on hugging or touching, tickling, even when the child says no. An adult who is over-interested in the sexuality of a particular child. An adult who insists on time alone with a child with no interruptions, or who spends most of his or her spare time with children rather than with their own peers. An adult who regularly offers to babysit many children for free or often takes children on overnight outings alone. One who buys children expensive gifts or gives them money for no reason or who frequently walks in on children in private places such as bathrooms or bedrooms. Someone who looks at child pornography, who talks about sexual fantasies with children, who encourages silence and secrets in a child, or who calls children sexual names like slut or whore. All of these are warning signs. And when you see some of these signs in an adult, you need to be aware that children might be in danger. Research shows that we have not been typically successful in rehabilitating criminals of any kind, whether they are pedophiles, thieves, or drug dealers. Obviously, that would suggest great caution in assuming that someone with a crim criminal record is fully rehabilitated, even more so when the result is that our children would be at risk. We are in the professional community just beginning to learn how to treat offenders. With specialized treatment, a sex offender who accepts full responsibility for his crime may learn to control his abusive behavior. When those who abuse have the support and tough love of friends and families, they are more likely to complete their treatment programs and to potentially live abuse-free lives. However, please note that this is a highly specialized treatment and it is very long-term.
Churches often naively think that they can help an offender with the means available in the church and end up putting offenders back into places where children are then at risk. Churches are not equipped to rehabilitate sex offenders. To assume otherwise is to be arrogant and dangerous. At the same time, that does not mean the churches should not be involved in the lives of offenders. We should boldly speak truth, demonstrate grace, and be willing to go the long haul. At the same time, protecting the children from the offender and the offender from those situations which would tempt him to act in damaging ways to children. Rehabilitation depends on many, many factors, numbers of offenses, kind of offense, sexual history of the offender, the treatment received, the support upon release from treatment or prison, the offender's level of denial, and so on. Caution must rule for the sake of the children, as those who are vulnerable always require our protection. Frankly, any offender who truly understands the risk and potential damage he might do to a child would willingly submit to protective boundaries for the sake of the children. Any offender who pushes on these boundaries is not safe for children. His trust in himself is not warranted. It is also important to note again and again that more and more abusers are under the age of 18. Just because the one accused of abusing is young in your eyes does not discredit the report. Many states require an age differential of about four or five years for the action to be legally called abuse. But that means that a 13-year-old can be the abuser of a 7-year-old. A 17-year-old can be the abuser of a 12-year-old. Such occurrences are not to be taken lightly. They are wrong before God and against the law as well. They are also a cry for help. Young offenders have troubled lives. This is not an excuse, nor does it minimize their action in any way. But it does call for a response from us that protects the victims and treats the young offender. I have often seen churches ignore such abuse because of the age of the offender or sometimes because of the status of his parents in the church community. That is as much a sin against the offender as it is against the children in the church because it means that the offending adolescent is not loved enough to be confronted with truth, protected from his own urges, put into treatment, or heard about what is happening in his own life. To file such behavior under sayings like boys will be boys is to act contrary to the word of God. It is crucial when talking about abuse of any kind to keep in mind that we're talking about abuse occurring to children. That means that the abuse is understood or processed by a child mind, not an adult mind. What are some of the things we know about children? Well, they do not know very much because they have not lived very long. So they are vulnerable, they are dependent, they are easily influenced. Children tend to think egocentrically. They believe the world revolves around them. That is why, for example, when parents divorce, children often think they are at fault. And they say or think things like, if I had been a good girl, mommy and daddy would still be together. Hence, children process abuse with thoughts such as, if I were not such a bad boy or girl, this would not be happening. I make people do bad things. Not only is their thinking egocentric, these thoughts also give them a sense of hope. Because if this is happening because I am bad, and if I can just figure out how to be good, it will stop. Such thinking also allows an abused child to continue to depend on his or her parents, which he must do to survive. Because the bad is located in him, not in the parent. Children also are learning. They do not know much of anything. They are learning how relationships work, what is good, what is bad, what it means to be male or female. Part of what parents do in raising their children is name the world. This is a tree, this is a house, this is a boat. This includes intangible and abstract things, such as this is what is good, this is what love looks like, this is what trust is. 
In the context of ongoing physical or sexual abuse, children learn that relationships are for using others. Good is evil. Evil is good. Pretense is necessary. And they are trash. Such profound lessons do not simply get dropped when they reach adulthood. Rather, such lessons become the control beliefs for the adult. Children are also, by definition, developing. Anything growing can be shaped. We believe good nutrition is important for our children because what they consume as they develop will affect their physical selves. Raising children in an environment of love and truth and wisdom and patience shapes their characters. Raising children in an environment of fear and evil and deceit and demeaning words shapes their characters as well. Anyone who gardens or prunes knows that shaping something when it is young and flexible is far easier than shaping something that is rigid and misshapen. We all know as adults that it is much easier to learn something as a child than to unlearn it and then relearn it as an adult. The effects of ongoing abuse on the life of a child and on their adult future are, needless to say, profound. I want to stop for a minute and clear up a pervasive myth about children. We hear again and again that children are resilient, meaning that they recover quickly from suffering or tragedy. The word resilient literally means capable of returning to an original shape or position. Abused children do not bounce back to the state they were in prior to the abuse. Children are not resilient. They are malleable. To be malleable is to be adaptable or capable of being shaped. There's a chapter entitled Incubated in Terror in the book Children, Youth, and Violence, The Search for Solutions, which was written by a Dr. Bruce Perry. He talks about this myth. The chapter discusses how violence alters the developing child. And in the context of neurodevelopment, the author examines how violence, such as be, being repeatedly assaulted by a parent, influences brain development and subsequent emotional, behavioral, cognitive, and social functioning of the children. Children can be permanently altered by growing up with ongoing family violence or abuse. As we consider some of the results or symptoms of childhood abuse, it is extremely important that we understand we are talking about indicators and not proofs. Many mistakes have been made when these indicators have been assumed by people to be proof that abuse has occurred, whether the abuse was remembered or not. This seems to be most often assumed regarding sexual abuse. An individual can manifest many of these symptoms and still never have experienced childhood sexual abuse. The indicators mean that an investigation is warranted, but again, they are not proof that it will be substantiated. What do you look for that might suggest ongoing abuse in the life of a child under your care? Children who are not being sexually abused but live in unhealthy families, again, may exhibit some of these behaviors. But those of you who work with children in some capacity, preschools, daycare centers, schools, youth groups, Sunday school, need to know what the indicators are and what your state law says about possible abuse. For example, in my state, the law says that those who, in the course of their work, have contact with children and have reason to believe that a child coming before them in the context of that work is an abused child must report. We are expected to be pretty certain that what we have seen and heard about is actually abuse, but we are not required to substantiate whether the abuse has actually occurred. The law in my state says that it must occur within the context of work and that you must have heard about it firsthand from the child. All state laws are not the same. So it's very important that you understand your residency state requirements. It is my understanding also that the courts in many states tend to err on the side of protecting children. That means that if a parent or relative or teacher or somebody who has contact with the child and is a credible person 
tells you that they suspect or know of abuse, that you may want to report it. You can call the Child Protective Services in your particular state and give them a hypothetical situation often and get their advice as to how to proceed. Most states have a toll-free hotline for help. Some of the physical warning signs, particularly for sexual abuse, are unexplained bru bruises, redness, bleeding of the genitals, anus, or mouth, pain at the genitals, anus, or mouth, or genital sores, or milky fluids in the genital areas. Obviously, signs of physical assault of the child would be things like repeated burns on the skin, lacerations, bruising, frequent broken bones, or obvious signs of malnourishment. If any of these signs are present in a child under your care, you need to consult with Child Protective Services immediately. Children who are being abused in any way tend to manifest their troubled feelings either internally or externally. Both types of behaviors can occur, but one is usually dominant in a child. Children who exhibit internal behaviors tend to be isolated and withdrawn. They attempt to negotiate the abuse by themselves, and they do not interact with others. They often show a cluster of some of the following signs. They appear withdrawn and unmotivated to seek interaction. They show signs of depression, such as sleep difficulties, lack of interest in food, difficulty concentrating, or a great sadness. They often show a lack of spontaneity and playfulness. Some of them are over-compliant or too good because of their fear. Many of them show phobias or fears of small spaces, closeness to people, or closed doors. Abused children sometimes have an excessive startle response. We would say they're very jumpy. They may have sleep disorders, nightmares, and night terrors. They may show regressed behavior and go back to things like thumb sucking or bedwetting. Sometimes you will hear somatic complaints. The child has frequent headaches or stomach aches. In older children, you may see eating disorders. In younger children and older children, you may see a trouble swallowing. Again, in older children, substance abuse may occur. The child may make suicidal gestures, and it's important that we not assume that young children cannot be suicidal. Children also sometimes exhibit what we would call self-punishing behaviors. They will cut or burn themselves or pull out their hair or sometimes stick pins in their body. Children with external manifestations engage in behavior that is directed toward others. They exhibit their feelings externally. Some indicators would be aggressive, hostile, and destructive behavior toward others. Some children may seem provocative, almost like they're trying to elicit abuse. They want to encourage the abusive behavior just to get it over with. Sometimes they will be violent, and they may kill and torture animals, or they may set fires. When children are being sexually abused, they may engage in sexualized behavior, preoccupations with sex, or precocious sexual activity. For example, in a nursery school, a four-year-old acting out intercourse with another child. Older children will sometimes engage in promiscuity. To ask a child to disclose abuse often precipitates an acute crisis for the child. The disclosure is full of anxiety, retractions, and inconsistencies. Memories are often fragmented, and they may change their perceptions. Those who do disclose abuse often feel guilt, fear, feelings of betrayal, and confusion. They may have been threatened, or they may have had a sibling or pet threatened if they tell. They may have been told that they or the abuser will be sent to jail. They may feel that they have betrayed their family. They may recant if they are put in foster care or if a parent is sent to prison. Children gravitate toward the felt safety of the familiar, no matter how painful it is. Children, however, rarely lie about abuse unless they are put up to it by another adult, which appears to be occurring in some nasty custody cases. It is very important for us to give children credibility when they disclose abuse of any kind and to pursue the proper channels by bringing it to the attention of those trained to determine whether or not it is true 
and those who will know how to get the child the help and treatment that they need. Let me give you just a few general guidelines for how to respond to abuse in the life of a child and how to protect a child. It is important that we develop wise and careful policies for our church communities so that the church is truly a safe place for vulnerable children. Churches often wait until abuse has been brought to the surface to begin to develop such policies and they are not prepared then to protect or help when it occurs. The church should consult with lawyers and child protective agencies with their denomination and with professionals who have expertise in these areas for developing their policies. You need to have information gathered and ready for how to report suspected abuse and you need to train church staff and volunteers in how to respond. Never discredit a child's report no matter who the alleged abuser is. Your spouse, your sibling, a pastor, or someone you are certain would never do such a thing. Remember that you do not have the ability to tell who is lying. Substantiation must be done by those who are trained. Repentance is consistent transformation over time, not simply nice words and a few tears. Know your limits. Children and offenders need to be seen, evaluated, and treated by those with expertise in these areas. Both need to be taken to those who are trained to help. Do not abandon them, either the children or the offenders, once they get into the system or into treatment. Walk with them, support them, encourage them, pray for them, and love them. They will need you to commit for the long haul. In Mark chapter 10, verses 13 and 14, we read the following. They were bringing the children to Jesus so that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant, and he said to them, Permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. And he took them in his arms and blessed them. We are the body he is the head. A body that does not follow its head is a sick body. As his body, we are to follow him in his response to children. He said we are not to forbid or hinder or prevent or stand in the way of children coming to him. He was indignant and grieved and displeased with those who did. The ones who grieved him were his disciples, his closest followers. If we are honest, we will admit that there are many ways that we hinder children coming to Christ. Certainly the physical and sexual abuse of a child is a powerful and long-lasting hindrance. I do not forget that or minimize that for a moment. But it is not just abusers who hinder our children, is it? We do it too, with our angry words, harsh treatment, criticisms, impatience, failure to speak truth, and our inconsistencies. Do we need to actively work to protect our children from the terrible hindrance that abuse is to a child's and often an adult's relationship to Christ? Absolutely. But we must not do so without also examining the ways we all individually and corporately hinder them as well. One more scripture, Matthew 18, 5 to 7 says this, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks. It is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to that man through whom the stumbling block comes. Jesus says here in this scripture that whoever offends Whoever is an impediment who trips up or causes distrust and desertion of the one who ought to be trusted and obeyed. Whoever does that to a little one or a child, which means someone who is less in size, age, rank, or influence, better that person should incur the most imminent peril to his life. Have a millstone turned by a donkey hung around his neck and be thrown into the ocean.
In other words, God is such a severe avenger of these offenses that it is better to suffer anything, including death, than to offend a child in this way. Such abuse or hindering has potentially eternal consequences in the life of the child. If we take this scripture at face value, then obviously God takes the abuse of a child very, very seriously. If we are to follow our head, then so must we. These verses also mean that those of us who have never abused a child must take very seriously anything we might do to hinder another who is less in size, age, rank, or influence. Anything that would trip them up in their relationship to God. God says those who are in our midst, who are vulnerable or weaker, are to be protected, never exploited. Children learn concretely. They learn through their five senses. They learn about abstract things. They learn about the unseen world of our God by way of what they see. In our churches and in our homes, we are trying to teach them about God and his love. We cannot see God. Our children cannot see God. They learn about what they cannot see by what they see in us, in the flesh. We want them to learn about God's love, about truth, about justice, about holiness. We teach them about God's love for them by the way we love them. When you say to a child, your heavenly father loves you, the child's mind thinks about God's love by way of his understanding of the love that you have demonstrated to the child. Abuse attributes false things to God and mangles the truth of scripture for children. When children are abused, they see in the flesh a series of lies about their heavenly father. Undoing that damage spiritually will take a long time and much hard work. Again, God's word says that we who would confuse children in that way would be better off dead Offending a little one so that they stumble in their relationship to God is a very serious matter. Clearly that can be done on an individual level in the ways that we treat children. The abuse of a child will have a profound impact on their spiritual lives. It is also true that institutions can offend corporately. That means a family or a church or a school can be a stumbling block to a child if they close ranks around the sex offender or abuser and protect him rather than the victim. It can happen when a family discredits and does not help the child when they disclose abuse. It can happen when a church body does not want to deal with the mess and chooses to ignore the wrongdoing. We must never forget that on the one hand, the cross of Christ is certainly sufficient for sex offenders and abusers. But at the same time, our God is very clear about his response to such sin. We follow a God who comforts the afflicted, who breaks every yoke, and who loosens the bonds of wickedness. He loves justice and truth. He abhors evil. His church is to look like he does, and where she does not, she teaches the little ones lies about who he is. I pray that we as the body of Christ never forget that the reputation of Christ is carried in our lives. And that if you and I want the next generation to know him truly, then who we are with them must bear the stamp of his character. May the true character of our God be taught by the lives we live, both individually and corporately, so that the next generation will know our Heavenly Father as He truly is, a refuge for the vulnerable and the weak. Mm -hmm.